You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 29, 2013, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, contact dermatitis. Our presenter is Dr. Sharon Jacob. She's an associate professor at the Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego, California. Go ahead and show your slideshow, and uh, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Jacob. Thanks for having me. Let me just make it bigger because you, you have the frame that I have. I see your slides. Go ahead and just present a slideshow. There you go. Okay. Thank you. All right. So thanks for having me today. I'm um, coming from San Diego. He mentioned uh, I'm an associate professor here at the VA and Rady Children's, which is a UCSD affiliate. Uh, for my disclosures, um, I'm a consultant um, what used to be Coria that is now Valiant. I've worked with Ortho Neutrogena, and I currently um, am working with Johnson & Johnson. I'm also a speaker for Smart Practice, and I'm currently doing um, an, in I'm an independent investigator for their um, PREA2 trial using the true test in children um, to seek FDA approval. So, um, so we're all on the same page. What I'm going to talk about today is what is allergic contact dermatitis. I want to make this uh, really practical. So I'm going to talk about systems of, systems of patch testing, pitfalls of patch testing, and then some resources that are available to you. So um, we need to discuss, and you just had the lecture on contact urticaria, but there's a big group of contact dermatitis. And in that group, irritant contact dermatitis is going to account for about 80% of um, the affected population. Um, allergic contact dermatitis is going to be about 20%. And contact urticaria, again, is, is much, much smaller um, part of that umbrella group. Contact urticaria, and again, you just had this lecture, but it is an immediate type um, contact hypersensitivity. You see the wheel and flare um, following contact with certain agents. Um, it is an immunologic event uh, as opposed to irritant contact derm, which is not um, necessarily considered the same way. Um, it can be IgE-mediated, and then there are also some non-IgE mechanisms. You do need to be previously sensitized, and there's preformed antibody. And then it, it relies on vasoactive amines. And you can see localized, um, which we see a lot of in our practice, versus referrals in from. They can be to things like natural latex and the cross-reacting foods, like banana, kiwi, um, cow's milk, egg. Uh, potato, seafood. Of importance, when we talk about patch testing, we do get referrals for contact urticaria. And um, one of the most important things to remember to do is that you want to look for the reaction early. Um, you're not going to be doing your delayed readings when you're looking at contact urticaria. You can also do that, but you need to make sure you're looking at the patch test reaction at about 15 to 30 minutes to see if you're seeing an urticarial type response under your patches. You can either put them in duplicate and then put it back on if you also want to see if the same patient has a delayed hypersensitivity to the same allergen. So here's a, um, a reaction um, to latex allergen. You can also um, put the glove directly on the patient and check for that. I usually do RAS testing before I do any kind of prick or patch testing um, when I'm worried about um, latex. Irritant contact dermatitis, again, is about 80% of that group. You're going to see mainly on the hands, face, um, eyes have a, a, a prevalence because those are the exposed areas. Um, it can happen to anybody. It doesn't require sensitization. And the way I try to think about it is that it's a matter of skin tolerance. So it's how strong is the skin versus how strong is the chemical that's applied to the skin. So with increasing strength of an irritant chemical, you'll get um, keratin site damage. And um, that's when you see um, some of the innate innate immune systems kick in and you see inflammation. Um, and that's why I wrote here that it can invoke the innate immune system. And in the past, we always thought of it as not having an innate base, um, but it does in a, in a uh, way. Um, one thing on irritant contact dermatitis, um, the skin thickness is important. That's why a lot of times we will see eyelid affected and the rest of the face not affected early on because that skin is thinner. So it will show up on thinner skin areas first. 
So in terms of comparing allergic and irritant, um, you want to think of irritant as more of an injurious reaction. Uh, the keratinocytes are damaged. And again, it's a, a concentration-dependent effect. So the, the stronger the chemical, the more likely you are to get the reaction. Again, history and physical will give you um, a lot of information and help you determine the difference between these two. Um, in chronic irritant, it is very hard to tell chronic irritant from a chronic allergic. But in the acute phases, they, they can be easily um, determined um, based a lot on history and physical. And then um, with allergic, it is a, t a type 4 delayed hypersensitivity reaction. Um, it requires low molecular weight haptins that bind to the keratinocytes and then provoke an immunologic event. Um, prior sensitization is required. Um, and we talk about people um, getting exposed, and then the next time they see the allergen, they may not um, have their reaction. With, but with each subsequent re, um, exposure, they're more likely to present their reaction. Things like poison ivy um, that bind so tightly to the keratinocytes could actually um, show up on the first exposure if the antigen was on the skin long enough, like several weeks. Um, the way that you um, test for allergic contact we're going to talk about is patch testing. Of importance, though, you can detect irritants by patch testing when you do that initial read at 48 hours. Um, but by the 96-hour read, the irritants will be getting better, whereas the allergens will be getting worse. So some appearance, just so that we're all on the same page, allergic could give you um, Macular erythema could give you induration. You could see papules and extreme reactions. You can see bulla. With, with irritant, you're going to see more of a, a, a slightly scaly surface with um, some pink backgrounds. Um, oftentimes, you can see excretions. And then you can also see um, follicular prominence uh, the, as the chemical has gone down the follicular unit. Um, it's most often limited to the irritant to the actual area of contact. So um, if you can imagine somebody puts their hand in bleach, um, where that line was that the hand stopped going into the bucket would be a well-demarcated line for irritant. And it tends to burn. Um, as opposed to allergic contact derm, which tends to itch. So that's a historical point that you want to ask the patient. Also for allergic, um, it won't give you necessarily that demarcated line. It often spills past the line because, again, it's an immunological event, and you can't maintain the T cells only in that area. They're going to disperse um, further away. Um, in terms of reaction timing, with allergic, you're looking at as early as 48 hours. Some can present earlier than that, but most often you're going to see the reaction at 72 to 120 hours after exposure, um, with, whereas with irritant, it's really usually seen within the first 48 hours. And again, it decrescendos. So by the 96th hour, when you're looking at a patch test, your irritant should be gone. Here's an example of irritant contact dermatitis where the patient Saliva is the irritant. They've been licking their lips. You see a very, very well demarcated line. And if you have the patient um, lick their lips in front of you, that, that line will, will actually correspond to um, their tongue where they can reach. Here's another example of an irritant contact derm. This is a patient who has been bleaching their hair. And the bleaching agent has gotten on the skin and um, caused the erythema. Here's the patient that um, I had seen in Miami who was a um, construction worker. He'd been dealing with cement. And here he's having a reaction to the chromium that is in cement. Um, again, allergic contact dermatitis affects about 20% of your contact derm group. It does require the prior sensitization and is T cell mediated. Um, so in terms of the type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, um, it, there are three phases of it. Mine's showing up. I don't know why it turned black. I'm sorry, it, it wasn't white. Um, I don't know if it's white on your screen. Um, but the three phases are sensitization, um, challenge, or re-exposure, and resolution. And the sensitization um, stage is, is the rate limiting step. So this is a, a picture from um, Sparasis, but like it because it tells you um, some kind of story. Um, in the upper left, you see the um, antigen um, getting into the skin and the dendritic cells capturing the antigen, taking it to the lymph node where it educates the, the T cell. And this naive T cell now knows 
um, the allergen. It knows what to look for. And then it goes into the lymphatic system and starts um, going into the skin and, and checking to see if that allergen is present. So when that allergen comes back the next time, um, you, you end up getting, um, getting activation of cytokines and more T cell cloning. I just want to go a little bit, I've kind of cut this into sections just to, to break it down a little bit. The first step takes about 7 to 21 days, that sensitization step. And again, you need to get recognition by the dendritic cells and present presentation to the T cells. When memory occurs, that's when you get T cell expansion, uh, Th1 clones, and that's because the naive cell has now become a cognizant of the presence of the antigen or the allergen. And then recall or challenge, um, that takes about 48 to 96 hours. Um, Re-recognition of antigen, so the next time you see the antigen, you get recruitment of memory T cells, and then secretions of um, IL-2, interferon gamma. Um, there's a nice study that um, took patch testing skin and, and biopsied it and found that there was increased expression of um, CCL27 uh, in the patch skin, and that um, correlated with increased number of infiltrating T cells. So that's retained for about 21 days. Um, and that's the basis for, for my clinical practice in terms of telling the patient to treat the patch test site area after we've done patch testing for three weeks. I actually mark the skin and have them treat that site even if um, the dermatitis in that patch is gone. And then step four um, is, is the challenge leading to inflammation. You get vasodilation, and then you, get, um, you can get resultant uh, dermatitis at other sites. So here's a, a lady that I patch test, and when I put the patch test on her back, she did not have this rash on her chest. Um, when I put the patches on, this came up at about 72 hours. And when I asked her about it, I said, you're wearing a front-loading front bra snap, are you, are you wearing jewelry there? And she was allergic to nickel. And she said, no, I stopped wearing front-loading bra snaps years and years ago, like 10 years ago, because I used to get really bad blistering reactions to them. So her skin remembered. And when we put the patches on her back, she got this reaction on her chest as a recall response. So that's, in a nutshell, the, the pathophysiology that is a, 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 a simplified pathophysiology, but just so that we're all on the same page. And then with resolution, um, the final step, um, macrophages remove the antigen, and then you, you, are, um, you get loss of antigen stimulation and resolution. And that's why avoidance is the mainstay of therapy, because when you take away the allergen or you don't re-expose, you have no reason to, to keep reacting. Um, the problem is um, you can get granulomatous reactions. And I think I have one in here to show you as well in addition to this one. But this is a tattoo pigment. If you see in the red here where the, the mercury um, tattoo pigment is, you'll see there's two papules in there. And those are granulomas. And the, the macrophages were not able to remove the tattoo pigment, so you get chronic stimulation. And I have seen quite a number of, of tattoo um, responses. Um, I have a, a patient with a gold, a couple of patients who have had granulomatous reactions to gold, and I think I have one further on in the presentation that I'd like to show you. One of them was about six months out, and they still they ended up having to have the reaction cut out because they had formed a keloid. So now, in my consent, I do um, ask if people have had keloid history in the past. So in terms of the approach to the patient, you want to make sure you get a history, you want to look for geographic clues, and you want to decide um, whether you're going to patch test. So reasons to patch test would be a new onset dermatitis. Um, this patient comes in, they're in their 20s and their 30s, they've never had atopic dermatitis, and now they have a dermatitis that won't go away. Um, or they're a patient who has atopic dermatitis and, or psoriasis, and they are progressing. They're getting worse. They're, they're deteriorating. Their body surface area is increasing. Um, or they have specific sites. If eyelids are involved or hands all the time, allergic contact is in the, is in the picture. And then some clinical presentations which are very um, worthwhile to consider is dyshydrosis, uh, chronic stasis dermatitis, adult onset eczema, and photodistributed um, dermatitis often get a high yield with those. And then recalcitrant dermatitis. So every time you're re-prescribing a steroid or a patient's only clearing with a super potent topical steroid, you want to consider um, 
patch testing. Sometimes the allergen source is quite apparent, uh, as in these. This is a paraphenylene diamine that's in black henna tattoo. You see, I've seen down to um, uh, 30 months now where people are going to fairs and going to on holidays. As, um, one patient was, had gone to Hawaii and his older brother was four and got a tattoo and on one. And uh, he, got, he got his tattoo and he blistering response in the shape of a dolphin. So sometimes it's very easy to, to predict what the allergen is because the association is right there. Here's another one um, of a Batman on a child uh, had had a black henna tattoo. Here's a patient. I usually ask people um, what they're looking at here, but um, in the interest of time, I, I'll just talk through. Um, this is a patient with toilet seat dermatitis. Oftentimes, these are related to the wood resins, um, and you'll see this very specific pattern. Um, so uh, exposure history, sometimes they can tell you they were walking in the woods, and you know here we don't see poison ivy, but we definitely see poison oak. So um, people will tell you a history that pr helps you predict the chemical allergens. This is a patient who wore um, ankle braces to help her walk. These uh, dermatitis was in the distribution of the rubber components, the foam inserts on her um, ankle gear, um, on her prosthetics. So um, that was a pretty easy thing to determine, okay, it's going to be the foam. But then the question was, what was in the foam? So we did extended patch testing on her. Here's a patient with um, periumbilical. Um, the umbilicus is um, superior to where we're looking. This is from a uh, belt buckle. Uh, oftentimes we talk about gene snap dermatitis with nickel. We, we don't see as much gene snaps. Now rivets have changed and most um, of the genes companies are moving away from using nickel, but we are seeing it with belt buckles and still some zippers. And then the chromium patient that I showed you earlier. This is a patient who is allergic to um, a formaldehyde resin um, that is in glue and uh, with its leather shoes and uh, wear we're not in contact with the shoe. You can see the sparing area, which is a very um, important pickup in terms of clinical uh, the clinical picture. And uh, I had prescribed her. She's allergic to formaldehyde and the glue resin. I prescribed her a topical steroid. She went to the pharmacy. She got a generic that had imidazolam urea, which is a formaldehyde releasing uh, preservative and uh, came back worse after seeing me and said, look, I'm worse than I've ever been. And it turned out that um, the generic had a formaldehyde releaser in it. So I uh, got her onto a um, topical that did not have a formaldehyde in it, and she did very well and has since cleared. This is a patient who was allergic to bacitracin. This is a um, classic look, um, an eczematous look after a punch biopsy that there's a punch site in the window. But again, you want to consider the things we provide to patients as well. Here's a patient that has um, paraphenylene diamine allergy. Um, the, oftentimes you see eyelid, an eyelid reaction when people dye their hair. It's not that the chemicals are you know, pouring down their face and into their eyelids. But I think that there's a component of aerosolization aerosolization. Um, when you're dyeing hair, you can smell the chemicals. And if you're allergic, um, if you can smell them, they're, they're penetrating your epidermis. So that's why I think the eyelid correlates when we see hair dye dermatitis. This is a patient that had come in. Um, this is a nice picture in terms of um, teaching because you can see the sparing of the vault. When you see the sparing of the vault, that clearing window, you think of allergic contact derm. When you see a confluent uh, plaque, um, it, you want to think about irritant contact derm. Like some people are, are uh, irritated by deodorants. But in an irritant, you would see the, the highest proportion of the dermatitis at the area where the um, contactant had contacted the skin. So with an aerosol um, deodorant, for example, with irritant, the center would be worse than the outside. And on the periphery here, you see these little papules. And when we see this look, um, you want to think about things that they're putting in the vault or the vault area. So you would think of deodorants. You would think of soaps, cleansers. You would think about fabric softeners. Um, this patient was allergic to their deodorant that contained the fragrance YRL, um, which is one of the newer ones in terms of fragrance allergy, allergens that has been described. This is a patient that I saw that knew she was allergic to paraphenylene diamine and um, 
she'd been not dyeing her hair for years. She'd um, come to see me and had uh, just dermatitis that was associated with hydrochlorothiazide. Got her off that and warned her of all the other potential cross-reactants with paraphenylene diamine. She went to the dentist. She told them, I'm allergic to this. I want to make sure I, you don't use any ester anesthetics on me. And he says, no, we're going to inject you with the, the xylocaine. We're no problem here. Nothing to worry about. And then the tech had put sensitine gel on her gums. And this was the eruption, the subsequent eruption to that. So um, it's really important to know the cross-reactors of these allergens as well. So in terms of um, prevalence and cost, um, contact dermatitis is a huge cost to society. It's a huge cost to the patient and their families. Um, this is an older slide. This doesn't really have again, but um, back in 2004, we were seeing about 72 million patients um, a year um, were having contact dermatitis, which correlated with $1.9 billion a year in cost. And, and patch testing has been shown to be cost effective. Um, back in 1989, when Rachel did the study, uh, they saw a cost-benefit ratio of about 40 to $90 million a year in savings. Um, and it is the gold standard to confirm a suspected allergic contact dermatitis. But it's still being underutilized. And that's why I'm so glad that you are having me give this lecture, because I'd really like to see more people doing patch testing, because we can really help patients this way. Um, I think we have about 800 members now. Um, but at this point, there were 750 members. Uh, 390 um, were North American members, because we have European um, members and South American members as well. And of those, about 60% of members were practicing um, comprehensive um, patch testing. So you're looking at about 240 comprehensive patch testers in the country. And out of dermatology, that's about 1% or 2% of us, which is really, really low. Um, patch testing is done in private practice. About 74% of dermatologists use the true test. But 83% were doing less than five patients a month. And allergists are performing both the true test and the comprehensive testing. Um, and that isn't captured in this data here. So how can we prove, improve our patch test efficacy when the source isn't as obvious as like toilet seat dermatitis or, or black hen too? So selecting the right patient, again, is important. Um, having a high index of suspicion. I, I get a lot of referrals, and, and I would say not all of them are, are contact germ. Not all of them are even allergic contact germ. Some are completely different things. I see drug reactions. I see um, people send in tinea. I, I, I get a wide range. So Selecting the right patient is important, and selecting the right chemical system. Um, testing the patient products. You don't want to test unknowns, but if the patient's been using products, you definitely want to consider right. testing those. And then giving the right uh, resource information. So this is a slide that just shows you capture rates. And if you look at David Cohen's study all the way yeah, to the Dr. Left, Jacob, we're yeah. not seeing your slides change. Are you connecting? Oh, there you go. OK, go ahead. Uh, did you see this one? Yeah, now we're seeing a change. Did you see this slide already? Um, uh, the last one we saw was the one with the uh, underarm. <laughs> it's been a oh, no. couple of minutes, but <laughs> we can we heard you talk and we understand the information, but it just stopped changing all of a sudden. But now now okay. it's changing. Now it's okay. This is, this is the lady with the um, paraphenylene diamine allergy that went to the dentist and got the benzocaine. So this is her reaction from that. Um, Here we go. Okay. Um, let's go to here. So can you see this slide? Yep, we got it. Thanks. Increase I don't know the number what about, I don't know. I'm sorry. So on the left, you'll see um, David Cohen's study from 1997. And he looked at the um, Trolab panel, which was what the AAD had put out at the time before the true test became available. And that was 20 allergen units. And then you compare it to, in 2003, they did the same study with the um, panel one and two of the true test. So that had 23 allergen units. And then compared in 2004, the 65 allergen units um, that the North American Contact Derm Group was doing. And you see capture rate increased from 15, about 15% to 24% to 77%. So the, the more allergens you use, the greater the chance of, of capturing um, the culprit. 
So you want to select the system. So again, the, the true test is the commercially available test. Um, it has 36 allergen mixes and a negative control. It is FDA approved, comes with patient handouts, and it doesn't require much special training in terms of, of use because all the, all the patches are already loaded. Um, the comprehensive or chamber patch testing um, has the ability to increase your number of rele relevant allergens because you can select whichever ones you want. It does require some more special training in terms of setting it up and design. So here's that um, pre-made test. And then again, that's a, a biological device that the FDA has approved. They, they make them go through safety and extensive uh, st standardization um, to make sure that it, each one is the same. Um, those are just being applied to the skin. They come with a little marking pen. Um, I don't want to be belabor on that too much. I want to show you more uh, other things as well. Um, allergies is made at the same company that makes the true test, and then you've got the options of chemo technique and Trolab, and all of these different companies have these um, wells that you can load depending on what you like. There's aluminum ones called the thin chambers, and there are these IQ chambers, which are the square ones from Chemo Technique. Here are some IQ chambers. These are the older model where you have to put the filter paper into the well yourself. Um, now they have them that are preloaded, so you don't have to um, worry about gluing those in for your liquid allergens. And here's a loading of, of thin chambers. Um, and again, you can see on the, we've hand-loaded the allergens onto each of those wells. And some of them don't have allergens in because these were made previously for the patient. And then at the time of arrival, the patient, the liquid allergens we put on filter papers and put in those wells that don't have allergens right now. Here's um, two patients loaded up with comprehensive patch testing. So you want to use the history to direct allergen selection, you want to look for clues. You want to ask where did the dermatitis begin, what sites are involved, because you're looking for regional clues. Um, you want to consider allergens known to be associated with certain locations. For example, eyelids, um, fragrances, nickel, formaldehyde are uh, top allergens in, in that group, fragrances being the top one. And dermatitis, things like quaternium-15, that's the top allergen, that's a formaldehyde-releasing preservative and cocomutylpropyl betaine, which is a um, detergent, a, a surfactant. Um, then you want to document currently active dermatitis. And the reason to do that is, and I do photographs of the patient at the console, is that at the time of the patch application, I have a, a map of where their dermatitis is. And then when they follow up at the 48 hours and then at the 96 hours, I check to see if their dermatitis has increased. If it has increased, I have a better sense that I have the correct allergens on them because I'm provoking their dermatitis. Um, here's a pediatric patient that we've loaded up. Um, it is important to note in these very small children, um, you kind of have to, their, their back size limits the number of patches you would be able to put, so you have to spend a little bit more time on history and identify more needed, um, exposures to try to uh, limit that number of allergens down. So schedule options, we always hear about the Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, I like Wednesday, Friday, Monday. It gives more time for the reactions, especially in older patients, so patients that are, say, over 75 and may even have come back on Tuesday um, of that to, to push it out a little bit further. Um, and then you could also do a Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, this one is a shorter one, and um, I tend to do that in younger patients or people who have had more of an, uh, 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 I don't want to say acute reaction, but more, more of a bullet reaction. If I say I've had bullet reactions when I'm getting my hair dyed, I will check them earlier rather than later. So here's um, some other patients I just want to show because when you put on the patches like I have on the little girl on the upper right, um, we also put their personal care products on at the same time. On the lower right, you see we've made up a, a patch on the bra sample. So we have the layers of the bra as you go through the, the actual fabric, foam, glue, and components to try to identify which part of that bra was causing the problem, especially if it's so well demarcated to the bra area will test bra. So we want to put the components such as bras, mattress covers, swimsuit, gear, gloves, shoes on at the same time as our standard patches. Here's um, a patient with the patches on. We're going to have her remove 
have those removed at 48 hours when she comes back in. And again, 72 to 120 hours for the delayed read. I always do um, hyperfix as a reinforcement on tape, especially on the younger children, because they tend to want to move them for you. And a moving patch is, is a bad idea, because then you don't know um, what, was, what was where. So for the ways to optimize your patch test, we always have them shower before the patches are placed. Then I don't let them shower all week. Um, for a patient with um, a lot of hair on their back, for example, I would have the patient shave three days three days prior to the patches being applied. If we shave them in clinic, we get like a razor burn type reaction that makes the, the read more difficult. No creams on their back on the day of the patch test. No steroids on their back for about seven days before the patch test. And, and in saying that, I mean so, um, not in the area where you're going to put the patch test. So if a parent says to me, oh, their back was really, really bad, I put steroids on, I ask them where they put their steroids. I mark where they put them to make sure we don't put the patches anywhere close to that, and we still can use the back. No oral uh, corticosteroids ingested less than two weeks or uh, intramuscular less than four weeks prior to patch testing. And then we recommend no uh, UV light or sun on the area for at least three weeks because all of these things can make reading the patch test more difficult. So the reads, again, uh, we have them back at the 24 to 48 hours. Um, the German group uh, removes children less than 12 at uh, 24 hours. And I do, um, in my children less than 8 years old, I do remove the patches at the 24-hour point. Um, and I've still got the same results. So um, the 48 hours I use is for adults. And then um, in duration testing. So we recommend uh, touching the patient. So I don't touch them at the 48-hour read. Um, I just take them down and take a look. But at the 96-hour read, I use a, 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 marker, a marking pen that we get from Staples. It's a, a fluorescent uh, highlighter. Uh, mark the patient on the left. You can, you can barely see the highlighter. And then when we flip them, you can see the squares. So I turn off the lights, and I feel the patient to see on the in duration with my finger. Because if I'm taking a look at the patient, I might start looking for redness. I'm looking for scale wears. I first do my in duration reading. And I pick up a lot of positives that way. Here's another patient. A lot of times, they want to know what you're drawing on their back with the smaller children. So I usually draw something on the bed next to them so they see what their back's going to look like. So here's some grading of reactions. We've got macular erythema on the left. They've got one plus reactions where they're starting to become barely palpable. Um, second from the left, on the um, next to the right, on the right going to the right, uh, I've got two plus reactions where you can start to see vesiculation. You're starting to see a confluent, um, indurated area, indurated plaque, and then all the way to the right, we've got the bullous reactions. The one on the upper right is a bullous reaction to hair dye, and that patient said they had the bullous reaction during um, during hair dyeing. Um, they they told me they were itching at the 40 hour 48 hour point. This is one of the first patients I had patch tested. Knowing what I know now, I would have taken her patches down at 24 hours and checked her and uh, not gone for a full bulla effect on her. Um, the the lower right is a bullous reaction to thimerosal. This was an irrelevant patch test. The patient had been sensitized to thimerosal probably through vaccination years ago. And when we put the patches on, she got a bullish reaction. But this did not correlate with the dermatitis we were seeing that day. Here's the gold reaction that I was telling you about earlier. Um, I've had two of these um, that became um, almost keloidal. This is one at three months. I followed both these patients out um, to two years. One of them ended up having to have um, this area cut out. And I saw a retained gold reaction. Um, about a month ago that um, was not fully keloidal, but had started to become um, more thickened and more plaque-like. Um, so we went ahead and injected that with steroids. And I, I do inject a lot of these reactions on now than I did earlier in my practice. You can get variations within one patient. You can get um, uh, irritant reactions. You can get 1 plus, 2 plus. Um, it's good to look at the whole patient. An irritant reaction on the, on the lower right panel, you see it's more, more white, scaly, um, and that's compared to their 2 plus reaction. I do know that some people would have called that a 3 plus reaction in the lower right just because of how extended it is beyond the, the well point. Um, but um, I, I would call that a 2. 
So um, be aware of false positive reactions. The number one false positive is a cobalt reaction, which is in your upper right. You see these little blue dots here correlating to um, cobalt, the metal going down the eccrine ostia and being oxidized and turning blue. It also gives you this punctate purpura, these little red spots. A lot of people overread this. And then irritant um, dermatitis is also oftentimes um, overread. They can't be clinically relevant, so um, you want to keep irritant in mind, um, but not overread them as allergens. This is a patient with an angry back. They're all red. It's the equivalent of taking off a Band-Aid, and you see all the red area there. It's very, very hard to read this patient. I usually have the patient wait in the office at least another half an hour to get another look uh, before they leave. Um, and I document, uh, take photos of the patches at the time of takedown as well. So some other um, things to be aware of in terms of false negatives. If you have proper contact with the allergen, if the patient removes them, the patient says they fall off, um, you, that's why I use the hyperfix. Um, if proper read, um, one of the things that can be missed is a presentation delay. Gold, steroids, and bacitracin are all notable to be out at 96 hours sometimes even further out. So if you only did a 48-hour read, those would be missed. Visual versus palpation, um, I can't stress that enough. I know a lot of people walk in, they take a look, they say, I don't see anything, and they walk back out, and they think the test is over. And uh, by feeling these patients, you really get a sense of induration, and you can capture more positives that way. Um, your two reactions, the punctate purpura is a um, can be a false read if you have the irritant reaction on top of an allergic phage. But you just got to see if it crescendos or crescendos. And it's called a bunker hill. And it's critical uh, suspicion despite a negative test. So you, you put the patches on the patient. They're all negative. And you know you, you know you have it right because the rest of the dermatitis has, failed, uh, has flared. So I liken this to the Battle of Bunker Hill, and the troops don't really know where to go. So they all go to the place where they know. So they're going to go back to the original dermatitis rather than going to the new site, which is on the back, which you want you want to capture. So you want to read those troops. So I will use um, mid-potency steroids um, during the patch test to try to calm down the uh, prior sites to get their T cells into their back where you want to see them. Um, I do use. Um, oral corticosteroids to calm patients down um, in order to get them right to their flare point for patch testing. So I liken this to a, a persistent intuitive clinical suspicion. So it's, it's like a poor clinical pathology correlation. So you get the pathology back, and it does not fit with what you saw clinically. This is how I feel about the, the negative patch test when I'm seeing recall sites flare. So you definitely want to photograph the patient early. You want to redirect. Uh, the troops. Again, I do use the corticosteroids and I do use the antihistamines. So the next question you have to ask yourself was, um, what's patch testing useful? Um, so at the pre-education, you might you, you want to make sure you tell the patient that there's always a possibility of a negative result. They may not get a positive patch. There's always the possibility that they're going to get a positive patch, like the thimerosal patient, where it's not the cause of their current dermatitis. Um, you, we usually explain delayed hypersensitivity reaction because we're having to explain to them why they have to come back for a whole week, whereas when they had their prick testing, they didn't have to come back all week. They only had to go once. So we, we kind of explain all of that as well. And then we're asking ourselves, did we get a positive reaction and a rash that worsened? That is our, that's our goal. That's a good thing. So if we got yes, then we have a good chance of detecting their allergen and getting them to avoid and getting them better. Um, positive reaction, that doesn't mean anything. It can be frustrating for the patient because they, they want something that's easy to avoid. And oftentimes, the thing they're having the response to is something they don't want to avoid. It could be something they've been doing for 30 years, and all of a sudden, they've met the threshold and they're reacting. They say, no, no, I've been doing that for 30 years. I know it's not that. But that's not the case. Now their body says it is that. So that can be very frustrating as well. And then a negative reaction it can be very good when it's not contact dermatitis. So that can help reassure the patient as well. 
So um, we would then go and review the labels on their products with them. We actually put their products on them at the same time as testing. So we will see, you know, we put their lotion on and it has the same exact morphologic response in terms of an exemitous response um, with their, their preservative on their back. So we know we have a nice correlation. And then we want to ask more questions about their specific routines to help them avoid. I just want to show you really quick the um, card and camp. These are computer um, programs that are available that help patients to do shopping for safer products. So um, the contact allergen replacement database was um, developed by Jimmy Anianis at uh, Mayo Clinic Scottsdale. Um, it's available at this Preventus site. It's now gone private. Um, what the provider does is enter the allergens into the system, and then it pulls up all the products that do not have those allergens in it, and the patient can look it up on their iPad, iPhone, iPod, whatever application they want to use um, while they're at the store, and they can shop with that. The CAMP is a contact allergen management program. It's um, done by the American Contact Derm Society. It's free for members, and if you go to the www.contactderm.org members only, um, it looks like this, and I'll just show you through these slides real quick. You go to databases and click on camp over here. It's the second one down. Put in your login number and name, accept their terms if you agree to them, and then you put in the patient's uh, it says generate a product list. You put in the patient's allergens, and uh, you click on them, put that into their list, and then it will provide you with a group, big group. I have to go through a lot of pages to get all their allergens in, but um, you can pick all the different products. You can pick their hair conditioner or shampoo. You can deselect all of those if you just want lip balms, for example, and uh, you can pick what products you want to get to the patient. Uh, it then has these narratives, and it'll tell you you're allergic to these two substances. And uh, here's uh, the list of products that you can now use. You should use any of these products, but just, just because they're on this list doesn't mean you won't have a reaction to them, but these are the safer lists. So then you've got your list here telling you shampoos, conditioners. Um, and it's like 40 pages usually of products you can use. And then you can put the patient's email address in there and email it to them so that they have it on their phone if they want to or in their computer when they're shopping, or you can print it out. So let me just, that, this is just showing you coming in their email and how it looks. A lot of, this is a set group of slides. So then you can pick narratives for each of the allergens, where they might be found, how to avoid them. Those are all available on the American Contact Derm Society in English, and as of this last year, they're all available in Spanish as well. So um, that's very good for our patients. So um, I have three questions here. Do you all do we open it up for for the answers, or how do we do this? Oh, well, sure, we can we can try to answer them. So so this this one's pretty straightforward. Um, the gold standard test to confirm allergic contact dermatitis is. A, a prick test, B, serology, C, clinical history, and D, patch test. D. D. Yeah, def definitely D, but you, you really do need the clinical history, but the patch test is the confirmation test. Um, the answer was marked wrong on there. That's why I fast went through that one. Which of the following is true of a irritant contact? So it is a delayed type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. It decrescendos in the patch test period. Clinically, it may appear beyond the area of exposure, and the rate-limiting step is sensitization. E? E. B. E. B. E. B. E. B is in boy. Yeah, so it decrescendos in the patch test period. And then a 45-year-old lady presents with a one-week history of pruritic scaly erythematous thin plaques on her hairline and eyelids. She tells you that she knows it's not her hair dye because she's been using it for years and this just happened. You tell her, A, it could very well be the hair dye and that she's become sensitized to a chemical in her hair dye, or B, agree with her and refer her to someone else. So the, re the, re the reason I have the reason I have this in here is that B is probably a better answer. Um, no, I'm just kidding. The reason I have this in here is because um, 
you know, in dermatology and, and, and allergy as well, you have the option to do the American Contact Derm Society Mentorship Program, and they pay a certain amount of money for you to go and visit with a contact derm person. And I had I had done that um, when I was a resident, and I was in clinic, and you kind of hold that mentor as your lifeline. And I had a patient. I patch tested her to paraphenylamine. She was allergic, and she just kept coming back with these blistering reactions. And I said to her you got to stop using this in your hair dye. And she said, it's got to be something else. And she kept coming back. So I called my lifeline. I called my mentor. And he picked up the phone. And I said, I have a problem. I said, I have a patient. I patch tested them. I said, I told them it's probably a product in their hair dye. He said, if it's a PPD allergic patient, there's a high probability that they're going to keep doing it. And he said, these are the ones that I've had the most difficulty with. So um, it, it, I do say it in jest, but I think that unless the patient up front, and that's why we talk about what, what the goal is of the patch test. That's why we talk about it up front. Because if the patient says to you, no matter what you tell me, if it's in my hair dye, I'm not going to avoid it, you might want to consider how you, how you approach this patient. So um, since the last time I talked to you, I have a, 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 another addition. So these are my three. These are all when they are, are one years old. And my daughter on the right turned one about two weeks ago. So I now have a four-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-year-old that keep, keep me busy. This is my real job. And then on the side, I'm doing patch testing. And the slide so, has a change. We can't see her. What's that? We can't see your picture. Oh, no. It didn't change. I don't know what the problem is. San Diego, maybe. <laughs> oh, there it is. No, there it is. There it is. Uh, everybody's eyeing now. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for that presentation. Thank you so much. Let me uh, take back the, uh, the control. I'll make us the presenter. Oh, that's nice. We're going to show our screen. So here we are again. We're back. Um, so uh, that was a whirlwind tour of uh, contact dermatitis. We, we were all riveted by your uh, presentation because we, we don't do it very often. So you know, seeing the practical how-to, I, I think, has been extremely uh, valuable. So um, any comments or questions from the audience? I know Brock, you had a question. So go ahead. Hi. Yeah, I'm EJ. I hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering what an allergy unit was with respect to uh, patch testing. How do they determine that? So how, you're asking how much should be in the well, how many micrograms? No, no. Uh, how do they define an allergy unit? The potency allergy. of the allergen. I, I don't understand the question. So you're asking how, how is the concentration determined? Uh, well, they uh, they were trying to standardize it, I think, and they gave it an allergen units is what they recommended, and I didn't know what an allergen unit was. Are you talking about the true test? Yeah. Okay. So with the true test, they actually have um, a whole formula, and um, it's very complicated. I actually tried to have somebody at the company explain it to me one day, but um, what they do is they take uh, the concentration, they take comprehensive testing studies where they know what percentage of patients that are um, allergic to the compound react, and they want to aim at about 85% so that they're not getting into the irritant range. And then they take that window and they create, it, it's a, he says it's a, an algorithm they have where they have to have that sustained allergen um, release from the gel matrix. The, those are gel matrices on, on the tree test, and it has to melt away and in unit per time because it, it's inherent to the, the gel. It, it's not something that is in comprehensive patch testing the same way because those are, are concentration, direct concentration, whereas in the gel unit, it melts away on contact with your skin and emits a unit dose. Does that make sense? Yeah, great. Thank well, you. I think it's a very difficult thing to determine because uh, uh, it involves the reactivity, the chemical with the skin, and you right. know, right. yeah. So it, that's yeah, a tough. And, and, and on that point, saying, um, which I think is really important, is you know, 
true test is good for some chemicals, and for other things it's not as good. For example, nickel, you know, that's a small metallic ion, it's, it's really easy to do. But with formaldehyde, which is a volatile substance, what they had to do was create a prodrug so it doesn't evaporate off. So until it evap sorry, until it gets in contact with the skin, melt has a re chemical reaction occur to become formaldehyde, it's not even the active agent. Mm. So you could you could potentially get false negatives on it based on the chemistry not occurring. Well, if the skin exactly. doesn't melt the gel, yeah. If it, if it doesn't melt the gel or if the reaction doesn't proceed properly. Wow, that's very interesting. Okay. And Dr. Dowling, you do a lot of patch testing for foods with the atopy patch tests. Yeah, that's a little bit different, though, isn't it? But um, we, we've been t patch testing with, for foods. How does that differ from what you saw with these other allergens? Uh -huh. So foods is, foods is very hard because um, there's not always the same amount of concentration within certain foods. For example, if you do tomatoes, depending on um, the, the season and depending on the type of tomato, you may have more cyanamic alcohol, you may have more coniferal alcohol. It, 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 it's not consistent. Um, one of the foods that I test is actually ketchup, and a lot of my topic children who are allergic and they're flaring with chocolate, they're flaring with, with ketchup orally, um, I will patch test them on their skin to ketchup and I will see reaction. Mm. Do you think that's from the ketchup or from the vinegar? I mean from um, the tomato or from the vinegar? I think it's from the tomato because they're, they're correlating with a positive to balsam of Peru as well. Hmm. Of course, I wouldn't bother to test for chocolate because who's going to avoid it? <laughs> that, that's when the that's when the tears start. So you know, I tell people, um, "Oh, you you're allergic to Boston Pro. It's it's going to be pretty easy. We're going to put you on this diet. There's just a couple of things. I'm going to just give you three things to avoid." And they're looking at you hopeful, and then you say soda, and they're like, oh, "Okay." You say tomatoes, and they're like, "Uh." -huh. And then you go chocolate, and they go, hey, "You want me to starve?" You know, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> um, because of because of that, um, Andrew Sheeman and I actually sat down and um, this last year went through the Boston Peru diet and took all the different components that we could out of it because not everybody is allergic to every component of Boston Peru. So we have a benzoic diet. We have a lot of different diets, and that's available on uh, the dermatitis um, at the dermatitis journal on the website if you want it. But it, it really helps patients with avoidance. The other thing that I think is very practical and very helpful is um, Matt Zyrus did an article this past year on uh, nickel dermatitis and the um, oral, oral avoidance diets. And he did the point system, so he assigned certain foods to certain points. And he said, OK, adults should not consume more than 15 points per day, and children um, you know, above 8 should not consume more than 10 points per day. And you look, American cheese has a point. You look at nickel, and it has you know, 10 points or something like that. So, um, sorry, you look at chocolate and how it has like 10 points. So you know, you know what food to group, and um, it can help with the food food avoidance diet specifically. Uh, of course, on Weight Watchers, chocolate has a lot of points too, but that's another <laughs> story. All right, we're going to have to stop there. That was just fantastic. We really appreciate your uh, joining us today, uh, Dr. Sharon Jacob from uh, La Jolla, California. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is Conferences Online Allergy. Um, we're going to end now. Um, join us again uh, on Friday when Dr. Goldsilver will be joining us to talk about chronic cough, and Dave Kahn will talk about drug allergy. In the meantime, have a great week, everyone, and we'll see you next time. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. See you next time.